I could show you some videos of these hop bifurcations to give you an idea that they're dangerous. There's aero elastic flutter. Think of Venetian blinds when you've got the windows open and at least when the wind speed is above some critical value, you're getting a hop bifurcation and those Venetian blinds start shaking. That's just annoying, but if you have wings or aircraft control surfaces that are oscillating, then this could be a problem. Let me show you this. So those are, you know, Venetian blinds. They did a test setup where they're just putting a single blind into some kind of bracket thing, and then they'll uh, turn on a fan. So here is, you can even hear the fan. As, they, as you crank up the speed, this thing starts vibrating. We're interpreting this as at low enough speeds, the straight configuration is stable and you're not getting this up and down vibration. It, it'll get damped out, but at large enough speeds, you do get that. And I don't know the details of the physics of this system. There's some relationship with the um, you know, vortex shedding and fluid dynamics. Here, they're just adjusting the, the angle with respect to the, the wind. Showing that it keeps happening, right? This would be like you adjusting your blinds open or shut. It seems to still be happening, but maybe it goes away at a large enough angle of attack. Let me think of it that way. Then he tried a bunch of blinds. So here's at low speeds. Nothing seems to be happening. But then crank up the speed. It's happening so fast you can't even see it. loud. So yeah, that's just annoying, but when it's on an airplane, I forget the name of the speed. There's some speed beyond which it's known that an airplane will do this. And so you're like told not to go past that speed, but this, this is crazy. Like that means the pilot's kind of losing control. So at low enough speeds, there could be perturbations, but the perturbations are, are dying out. You've got a stable equilibrium. And then once, uh, and there could be an unstable cycle. So you can think of it that way. If there's an unstable cycle and you have a perturbation that takes you above that unstable cycle, then you'll be kind of going to that large amplitude stable cycle. And once the once the uh, unstable cycle has merged with the origin, now all you have is this large amplitude stable cycle, which is not desirable. You could have other cases where there's a, a limit cycle bifurcation. This was a, a subcritical hop examples, but you could get other things. You could get supercritical hop. We've seen some already and haven't really discussed it. There's a chemical oscillator, these oscillating chemical reactions that are an example of a supercritical off bifurcation. Most chemical reactions, right, you get them started and they'll go to equilibrium. And it was this discovery in the 1950s by a Russian biochemist named uh, Boris Velosov. And nobody believed him for a while. He kept submitting his paper on this discovery of a chemical reaction that seemed to be periodic in the sense that you can even see it. The chemical reaction in the beaker, it's changing color periodically. So it's not settling down, it's changing color on a time scale that you can see it. So Belisov did this in the 1950s and kept getting papers rejected. Like, no, this is crazy. This is, this can't happen. Finally got it accepted and then other people started verifying it. There was a grad student that later verified it in the 1960s, also in Russia, named Zabotinsky. So this was the first verification. So now it's called the Bolosov Zabotinsky or BZ reaction. And I'll show it to you so you can get an idea of what's going on here. It involves mixing a bunch of weird chemicals that. I don't quite understand, like chlorine dioxide, iodine, malonic acid. But you can turn it into effectively a two-dimensional model. Here it is. 
you start with some water, add some sulfuric acid. And I think this mixing just makes sure everything mixes well. So there's a uh, mixing going on. Malonic acid beats me with that is, I don't, I don't know what that is. That looks dangerous. And then whatever this is, again, looks dangerous. You wait a couple of minutes and then the magic happens. It's changing color periodically. So it's not settling down. It's changing. So it gets clear, it gets dark, it gets clear, it gets dark. And this was interesting because there are known biochemical reactions like the Krebs cycle that are known to not settle down to an equilibrium. But this is sort of a simple tabletop thing that uh, was discovered. And now it's kind of the paradigm of an oscillating chemical reaction. People said, no, this can't have, it's like a perpetual motion machine. I don't know the details of, it. you know, if you wait forever, what will happen to this? Will it eventually settle down? I don't know. But on the short enough time scales where we can observe it, it forms a cycle. And that's kind of cool. If you write down the chemical reaction rate equations, non-dimensionalize them, you'll get something that looks like x dot equals with some parameters, uh, a minus x minus 4xy divided by 1 plus x squared, y dot equals bx one minus y over one plus x squared. This doesn't look anything like what we had before. These denominators are, would cause trouble for me. So you've got this and x and uh, y greater than equal to zero, a and b are definitely greater than zero. So we're only in the first quadrant and we won't analyze this in detail. If you want to know more, you could look in section 8.3 of Strogatz. But one of the key things is there is a fixed point and you could analyze what happens to that fixed point. It goes from being a stable spiral to an unstable spiral. And then if you were to evaluate something like parameters up above where there's, you take three partial derivatives of the right-hand sides you could show that a supercritical Hopf bifurcation occurs. So there's a fixed point which undergoes a supercritical Hopf bifurcation. These parameters A and B, I don't know exactly what they relate to. I don't know if it's the concentrations, like you have to put in a certain concentration for these reactants, or if it's related to the reaction rate constants, which are just sort of a kind of a law of nature thing that you can't change. What it looks like in terms of a phase portrait is this. Before the bifurcation, everything really is settling down to equilibrium. So this makes sense to people. But you can get a case where there's a, a stable limit cycle here. The fixed point, maybe I'll draw the fixed point. Here's the fixed point before bifurcation, fixed point after bifurcation becomes unstable and you have a stable limit cycle. And in fact, you could look at the parameters in the parameter space of A and B, look at where the bifurcation occurs. Remember these were non-dimensional. When you're in the right range, so this says uh, over here on the right phase portrait, this was A equals 10. B equals two, we're down here. And then A equals 10, B equals four kind of up here. So right on the two sides of that boundary, but you could look at the entire thing and get an idea. So that's before the bifurcation, and then this is after bifurcation. I could also show you a nice little video of what the bifurcation looks like. You could look at just the vector field, or you could look at this. So this is showing sort of the standard supercritical hop bifurcation. It's written in terms of Cartesian. There's the phase plane on the left, it's showing the null clines, and then on the right, we're showing x, y, and uh, mu. So this is gonna go from a negative value of mu, you see negative, mu equals negative 0.277. And then as we, as this gets closer and closer to the bifurcation, now we've got the stable limit cycle. And so it's showing in purple, the unstable fixed point, and then green, that stable limit cycle. So it's more of a, it's like an animated version of those schematics I showed before. 
And you might wonder like, what, what happens? This is just the local picture near the bifurcation. You can have multiple things going on. You could have like a bubble where there's a Hopf bifurcation and then you've got this cycle that then shrinks back down in another Hopf bifurcation. I call it a bubble. I don't know what other people do, but if you have a parameter and let's say you've got some you know, stable fixed point and then it goes unstable, becomes an unstable spiral and then it's stable again. And then you could have a limit cycle, a Hopf bifurcation happens and you have a limit cycle that then closes back up and another Hopf bifurcation. So just in that range, you have a limit cycle. So at these two points, we might label those as H, right? H equals Hopf bifurcation. So it's not like these things will increase without bound. They often have to go somewhere. This would be a stable one. So a super, it's super critical. Both of the Hopf bifurcations are super critical because the periodic orbit that shows up, the limit cycle that shows up is, is stable. You could have the same kind of thing where there's a, uh, an unstable branch that then goes stable and maybe just for a short period of parameter. And then there's a, an unstable. And these things about how the amplitude grows are just very close to the Hopf bifurcation. Maybe we call these H sup, and then these would be H sub. H sub is a subcritical. I guess I should make that uh, dashed, right? Just to kind of continuity. There we go. And then if you're on the outside of that, I don't know, things are going to some other distant object. Bifurcation. And then what do we call this? Uh, supercritical. So over a, a limited range of the parameter space, you can get these things. And other things can happen, like what we showed up above of there's two limit cycles and they merge. That would be more of a bifurcation of limit cycles. Right now, we're still just talking about bifurcations of fixed points. Next time, we'll talk about other types of bifurcations that include those of limit cycles. I could show you some work where we found some of these things. There's a paper on the dynamics of gliding. So our model is a pretty simple model. It takes as input lift and drag curves for an airfoil. Our face space is the face space of the horizontal or Vx and downward velocity Vz. Equilibrium points correspond to points of equilibrium gliding. But we get all kinds of fixed points that people hadn't really looked at before. There's saddle points, right? There's stable nodes, there's stable spirals. There's all kinds of weird things going on. There's bifurcations happening. If we look at over here, this is sort of a bifurcation diagram where we've got on this, the y-axis is sort of the condition. It's the, it's the glide angle with respect to the vertical. So 20 degrees means 20 degrees down compared to, I mean, compared to horizontal. And for this flying squirrel, uh, for a large range of this, this other angle down here is the, um, the pitch of the airfoil. So for the pitch of the airfoil that's slightly negative, you've got just one stable point and it's a stable node, but then you get all these weird things happening and they look like the types of bifurcations that we've seen for um, in 1D. So the zero eigenvalue ones. And then we looked at the flying snake, the thing that's particularly interesting, and we set it apart, was for the flying squirrel actually showed a, an unstable limit cycle. So for some values of the parameter starting uh, over here, like negative 10 degrees, this 10 degrees, think of this as the mu parameter, and we've got an unstable focus. That's just another word for unstable spiral. It, turns into a stable focus. And then there's also this limit cycle it sort of grows like crazy. And then it goes beyond the bounds of what we even had data for. So I would suspect that it actually collapses back down. I think we would have something that's coming back down and we'd have another hop bifurcation there. And it's kind of odd. So this is what it looks like. 
you have an unstable limit cycle that surrounds a stable point, which means the interpretation here is the scroll could never get to that stable point because it'll be repelled by the unstable cycle. Because when a squirrel jumps, unless it's very careful and able to have the speed of exactly that fixed point, it usually starts out like jumping sideways and then it just sort of goes wherever the dynamics takes it. So if there's an unstable limit cycle, it can't cross that, so it can't go there. So it's, that's kind of odd. This shows some actual data. These are hash marks of what an individual squirrel did. And here's another unstable limit cycle for a squirrel. We, act, we didn't find any stable limit cycles here, which we were kind of surprised by. That's, that's the kind of thing that could happen. It could tell you something about limit cycles. We talk about stable and unstable limit cycles, but you could have portions of a limit cycle that are repelling nearby trajectories, which means it's not uniformly stable. That's kind of the picture we have, but limit cycles are just stable or unstable in an overall sense, like kind of an averaged sense. And I'm thinking of a case far from bifurcation. You could have a limit cycle where there are portions of it where nearby trajectories are attracted. And then other portions, maybe we would want to do those as sort of dash, where nearby trajectories are repelled. But overall, the thing would be called a stable limit cycle, or if the unstable part sort of dominates. So there's been some work looking at that. There's a paper by Ali and Metzinger on the local stability of limit cycles. And so they looked at, here's that picture. The conventional picture is the one on the left of, you have a limit cycle that's stable, or we would call it orbitally stable. And so we think of it as everything kind of goes onto it. But you could have something that's orbitally stable overall, and yet portions of it are unstable. It's just that the portions that are stable sort of dominate in some sense. Any perturbation away sort of gets um, damped out by the stable part of it. So that's kind of interesting. It also suggests, you know, if you were to perturb one of this sort of half stable cycle on, on the right in the unstable side, maybe you could lead to some catastrophic effect that you wouldn't otherwise know about if you just had this conventional view. They sort of talk about that and try to come up with a way to deal with these systems and look at an example. I guess another thing to know about is that you could have hop bifurcations and limit cycles, even though they are like they're locally periodic curves, you could have hop bifurcations in any dimension. So they can occur in n-dimensional systems. So you could have something that's 3D and yet there's a some limit cycle that shows up surrounding an unstable point. As long as you have a fixed point, and if you have a fixed point in n-dimensions, you'll have n eigenvalues. But as long as two of them are crossing the imaginary axis, there's the possibility that a hop bifurcation is going on. And there's other methods to find out exactly if one is going on, but that goes beyond what we can cover here. But I could point you to the right places if you want to know. So hop bifurcations are very general. Another thing is that hop bifurcations, like the saddle node, are robust to perturbations. So that means they're structurally stable. There doesn't have to be like symmetry to a system or something. These things will really be seen in actual systems. They're not fragile. They will really show up. And the fact that we could see them in systems, experimental systems, is a clue that they are robust. In some sense, the main two robust perturbations out there are the hop bifurcation and the saddle node bifurcation. And all of the others are kind of fragile and can be made up of locally saddle nodes or hop. So I think I'll stop there for next time. We'll talk about kind of global bifurcations. So these will be bifurcations related to homoclinic orbits and limit cycles. But we're trying to finish up things with two-dimensional systems that we could eventually go to 3D, where we could talk about chaos and um, then eventually maps and chaos and maps.